Hi, everyone. Um, I want to welcome you all to this teach-in uh, titled Sudan Revolution and Counter-Revolution. Thank you for being here, and thank you also to the various co-sponsors of this forum, including Internationalism from Below, the Tempest Collective, Africa as a Country, DSA Afro-Socialists and Socialists of Color Caucus, Dissenters, New Politics, Review of African Political Economy, Spring Magazine, and Haymarket Books. My name is Nasreen Al-Amin. I'm an assistant professor of international studies at Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania, and I'll be the moderator for today's conversation. Um, we're gathering today to discuss not only the military coup that took place on October 25th in Sudan, or that some would argue began after the ouster of al-Bashir and its aftermath, but also the ongoing revolution in Sudan, demands made by the popular elements of the revolution, the role various international actors have played in Sudan since the ouster of al-Bashir, and the role people in the diaspora and beyond can play to support the revolution and to stand in solidarity with people in Sudan. To discuss all this, we have three brilliant minds and activists with us today, Muzan al-Nil, Raja Makawi, and Jean-Baptiste Galopin. I hope I didn't butcher your name. Um, before reading their bios, I'd like to say that because this is a teach-in rather than an academic panel, um, I'm mostly here to facilitate a conversation as best as I can, given that we're on Zoom. My aim is to speak as little as possible after this introduction, but to simply be the conduit between the audience's comments and questions and our guests. For this to be more like a conversation than a panel, I ask that you engage as if we were all sitting together. Send me your questions and comments, but please keep them uh, relatively brief and please use simple language. Um, before introducing our speakers who are joining us from London, Berlin, and Khartoum, I'd like to take a mo moment to pay homage to all those who have been killed resisting this military regime and to their lo loved ones, not only over the last two weeks, but over the past 30 years as well. Um, our first speaker today is Muzan Al-Nil. Um, Muzan Al-Nil is an activist and writer in Sudan. She's based in Khartoum. She's the co-founder and managing director of the Innovation Science and Technology Think Tank, think tank sorry, for people-centered development, Istinad in Khartoum, and is a non-resident fellow of the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy, focusing on a people-centric approach to economy, industry, and the environment in Sudan. She also consults on industrial policy at the Industrial Research and Consultancy Center in Sudan. Our second speaker is Jean-Baptiste Galopin. Jean-Baptiste is a researcher working on the Horn of Africa. He's the former Sudan researcher at Amnesty International and has written on the role of the UAE and Saudi Arabia in Sudan's counter-revolution and the political economy of the Sudanese transition. His writing has appeared in Le Monde Diplomatique, the London Review of Books, Democracy and Security, and the Project on Middle East Political Science. He holds a PhD in sociology from Yale University. And our third speaker today is Raja Makawi. Raja is a Sudanese democracy activist living in London. She's principal editor on the Debating Ideas platform at African Arguments, as well as leading publications and website administrator at the Rift Valley Institute. She's co-author of Sudan's Unfinished Democracy, The Promise and Betrayal of a People's Revolution, forthcoming in March from Hearst Publishers, and honorary research associate at the Institute for Humanities in Africa. Previously, she was commissioning editor with Z Books. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Muzan, uh, who's going to speak first. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you, Nisreen, for the introduction. Um, thank you, everybody, for your time. Um, I hope to be able to reflect the situation on the ground uh, in Sudan and amplify the voices of the Sudanese resistance, uh, since uh, the Sudanese people have been under a nationwide internet shutdown for 15 days now since the coup, um, causing any communication from inside the country similar to this one um, to require a good amount of extraordinary me uh, measures and a good amount of risk as well. Um, let me start um, with some background. Um, since signing the power sharing agreement in 2019 uh, between the military and the civilians um, from the forces of the Declaration of Freedom of Spain, known as the FFC, um, there was always a level of tension and conflict between um, the demands of the resistance and the policies um, and the decisions of the power sharing uh, government. Um, the resistance was organized in neighborhood resistance committees, uh, which were initially in charge of 
field operations. That's um, organizing protests, building barricades, uh, distributing pamphlets, and so on. Um, the committees evolved um, to become basically the political voice of the streets over the past two years. And this included um, several conflicts and protests um, against the policies of the government, such as uh, the day of the investigation and trials um, for the victims of the massacre of June 2019, uh, the prioritization of amending key legislation, um, um, economic liberalization policies, and so on. Um, the protests, however, always were polite, um, assuring support for the government before mentioning the demands. Uh, that was uh, due to the messaging of the government and the ruling bloc, which repeated that any objection to the government will lead to hand in the power to the military. So, um, and economic liberalization policies were also promoted by the government as a necessary step to achieve reintegration in the international community and thereby somehow a success. Uh, the same for the normalization with the occupation government on Palestinian land. And uh, this bought the government a lot of time with the public. However, uh, the government and the resistance uh, committees kept drifting apart. Um, a lot of history happened in the past two years, but let's jump to a few weeks leading to the coup. Um, and those few weeks, maybe six weeks before the coup, uh, tensions started rising between the military and the civilians in the government itself. Uh, military leaders started giving speeches about the failure of the civilian government, utilizing uh, the failure of um, economic liberalization measures, which actually led to over 150% increase in cost of living over the past year alone. So um, it's also worth noting that the head of the coup, General Burhan, has endorsed those same policies that he utilized as a tool for legitimate legitimizing the coup, um, has endorsed them in the first press conference um, that he did in the day right after the coup. Um, now, resistance committees and um, labor unions and um, different types of labor groups as well uh, and demand-based groups started preparing for the coup uh, in the weeks before it. Some unions even issued um, proactive strike announcements uh, that go effective at the moment of the coup, as written the statements themselves. The resistance committees organized and called for uh, the October 21st Millions March under the slogan, Down with the Partnership of Blood. The Partnership of Blood here being the partnership between the military um, and the civilian. Uh, so at the level of the resistance committees, uh, it was very clear by then that power cannot be shared and that the partnership with uh, the military criminals or the military in general is a compromise on justice. Um, the October 21st uh, March was huge, um, from cities to camps of IDPs, um, people were in the streets uh, that day, and um, my personal observation, however, of that day was that the slogans and the chants repeated by the protesters on the streets were not as radical as those in the posters of the resistance committees. People were still chanting for a civilian-led government. It was not down with the partnership of blood in the streets yet. Um, people were uh, chanting for handing over uh, the seat of the head of the government to the civilian side within the same power-sharing agreement. Um, there was no clear um, path for, for the people uh, uh, out of the agreement uh, that the public could um, um, imagine and, and stand behind at that time. So uh, on the morning of October 25th, um, with the cool signs uh, coming clearer, uh, that included scrambling radio stations, uh, regular programming on national television was put on hold and replaced with old music, internet shutdown, uh, more army vehicles in the streets, um, than usual. And in reality, since the power sharing agreement two years ago, military presence inside the cities has increased remarkably. Uh, but this was even more on the day of the coup. Um, there were also the rumors of the detention of the prime minister and members of his cabinet. And people directly went to the streets in the early morning, as early as 6 a.m., building barricades and marching to the main streets and uh, bridges. Um, strike calls were activated, basically, and the country was shut down on that day. Uh, we lost four martyrs on that day by the hands of the military coup, uh, who went as far as firing anti-craft machine guns at protesters and inside neighborhoods. We lost more than 18 um, um, protesters since then. And um, those are the confirmed numbers, not counting what we might not hear, uh, hear of due to the internet shutdown and even occasionally uh, phone network shutdown as well. Um, the coup, however, hardened the position of the public and the resistance committees against the military. Uh, total removal of the military from politics, which was seen as a radical and dreamy uh, thing by many uh, up until a few days before the coup, is now mainstream position of the Sudanese people. Um, in the past 15 days since the coup, resistance committees engaged in tasks of organizing protests, building barricades, 
political education, um, enabling civil and civil disobedience inside the neighborhood by basically providing the basic uh, goods and services for the population of the neighborhood. And in some areas, uh, they even uh, were working on electing and appointing local government. Um, the labor force have also was also involved in strikes and protests. Um, one of which was uh, the teachers' protest yesterday, where over 100 teachers were detained and moved to prison. Uh, one of which was a teacher who uh, suffered a, a miscarriage due to the violence uh, of the school forces and their refusal to provide her medical care. Um, the labor organizations and their resistance, however, was not as successful, still as not as successful or organized as the resistance committee. That's, that's just the reality. Um, the reason behind that is basically that labor organization did not organize as much as the neighborhood resistance committees over the past few years. Um, the, maybe the, the policies of, of, of consensus um, that tented the past two years have had a hand on that, as well as uh, the delay of new union laws, um, necessary amendments of labor law to ensure the right to organize and, and strike. So, for example, unfair dismissal from work is not incriminated uh, in Sudan, and it has not been over the past two years. It was not even an issue that was touched or prioritized by the government, which weakened the workers' positions in organizing or utilizing strike as a tool of protest. Um, the, the government's interest in accession to WTO might have a big hand in deprioritizing progressive labor laws and also uh, the government's prioritizing of IMF and World Bank requirements and um, um, you know, thereby their demands would prioritize uh, pro-private sector laws. Uh, labor laws in general were a field where international think tanks invested heavily in Sudan to divert and slow the process. Uh, to push for um, you know, forms of organization that are less threatening to the state and to the businesses. Um, on the other side, even when the government tried to enact laws that limit the work of neighborhood resistance committees and turn them into part of the state apparatus, uh, this was resisted by the resistance committees and the government failed to do so. Uh, so basically, clear weaknesses can be seen regarding labor organization and, and, it's, and it's an issue that we need to work on um, to create a, a stronger resistance front as well. Uh, the power of the resistance committees, um, which basically came from their decentralization and their geography-based structure, it is also a weakness in terms of uh, defining a political stance or an ideology, which is needed for, uh, for uh, the, the radical battle against counter-revolution. Um, currently, the resistance committees are leading the movement on the ground. They are deciding the, the schedules, the routes of the marshes um, and the barricades uh, uh, where they go. Um, they also decide in the slogans and the, and the demands. And uh, there have been many attempts previously to create a structure that pr brings together uh, many resistance committees. Uh, however, those efforts were accelerated during the past 15 days since the coup. Uh, coordinating bodies are being created to bring together, together resistance committees at the level of the city or at, even at the level of the state. Uh, in some places, and um, the aim is basically to be able to act faster and take decisions and uh, implement them faster. Uh, and also, those coordination efforts include attempts to create joint demands. Um, uh, such efforts are, are currently limited uh, by the internet shutdown, making coordination between states very difficult. So there is uh, there is more coordination within the same uh, state. So uh, I know more of the coordination inside Khartoum. I don't know much about the coordination. Uh, Khartoum being the capital, I don't know much about the coordination outside the capital. Uh, but also working on joint sets of demands has been a path for the committees into discussing revolutionary scenarios, uh, imagining different forms of governance, uh, of constitution making process, and, and to review those scenarios and, and, and demands and imaginations in a more critical manner than, than they did before. Um, the committees are engaged thereby in intellectual work as much as they are engaged in protests and building barricades. Um, however, you can watch the news about Sudan on big regional and international networks for days and not hear a word about resistance committees and not know that resistance committees um, exist. Um, although all protests are bland, planned, uh, called for, organized uh, by the committees, mainstream media still insists that these are protests answering the calls of the, of the FSC, uh, the, freedom, the forces of freedom and change. Uh, the media is uh, both unable and unwilling to understand and reflect the real role of the resistance committees. Uh, the committees and their organizing is, is what stopped the coup, basically, from, from being successful uh, or being fully success, successful. They are for the main tool that we as Sudanese people uh, like to share with the revolutionaries around the world. And um, it's, it's also important to point out that, in my opinion, the committees, as important as they are and as much of a, an important figure they are right now, 
uh, they have their limitations. Being geographically based and originally designed for field work, they, they will not be capable of evolving into the revolutionary organization, in my opinion, at least not easily and not without some serious divides if that is to happen. Uh, the committees are united now, definitely, against the coup, and that is understandable at the time of war, which is what, where we are right now. However, at the time of peace, this unity cannot hold. Um, the contradictions of interest between the different neighborhoods will appear. Uh, we know that from analysis, and also we know that from experience, because it was not very long ago when the committees in upper middle class neighborhoods were coordinating with the police to secure their neighborhoods, or doing public campaigns against illegal immigrants living in their neighborhoods. Uh, those committees uh, cannot hold unity with other resistance committees in poorer neighborhoods where the police is basically the main face of the state and the main enemy. So uh, building the revolutionary organization is therefore, in my opinion, a task that we are still to start seriously. Uh, there's a base, but we are still to start seriously. Um, however, right now, the resistance committees are united against the coup. Uh, with clear uh, three no's slogan uh, against the military, that is no partnership, no negotiation, and no compromise. Uh, the main enemy, therefore, here are the mediators. Uh, the different uh, efforts to restore pre-coup power share, uh, the, the pre-coup situation of power sharing. Um, major parties involved in that include uh, the representative of the UN General Secretary in Sudan, who is heavily invested in mediation efforts between the military and the detained prime minister. Uh, also, the U.S. envoy to the Horn of Africa, who, who called the demands uh, for removing military from politics unrealistic demands, and who also described the military's violent reactions to protests and the killing of over 18 protesters, he described that as military exercise and restraint. Um, the, there are also national mediators, of course, including businessmen, uh, civil society figures, who are heavily funded through their think tanks or NGOs by European think tanks and um, American aid. Uh, these offers were publicly rejected by the committees, um, which made several actors attempt to control, to restrain the work of the committees uh, themselves. One of these attempts was a recent invitation by the Prime Minister, who is in detention, to, re to the resistance committees to visit him for an update on the status quo. Uh, the resistance committees publicly rejected the invitation and announced that they can arrange public meetings for the Prime Minister in the streets if he wants to talk to the people and that they are not interested in negotiations or mediation efforts. Uh, this rejection of closed room politics um, is brand new to Sudan, like actually many things and many actions and decisions that the resistance committees uh, do. Um, I, I, I tried as much as possible to, to highlight what the situation is like right now. And finally, I just want to highlight that the best support that the Sudanese revolution, revolution can get from international revolutionary allies is that for them to stop their counter-revolutionary government efforts uh, from forcing a government on killer, of killers on Sudan for a second time. Right? Um, wherever you are, just ask where and what your government is spending money on in Sudan and call out any counter-revolutionary efforts towards another compromise, or at least the attempts to, to again, um, for a second time, legitimize military ruling. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Muzan, for that insight and analysis. Um, we're going to go next to Jean-Baptiste. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to speak at this panel. It's a pleasure to be in such smart company. Um, Danny Postel from Internationalism from Below reached out to me and asked that I speak about the impact of regional counter-revolutionary efforts in Sudan. And that's a topic I discussed in a number of pieces I wrote, including for the uh, project on Middle East political science, as well as a policy brief I put out last year for the European Council on Foreign Relations, and I encourage you to have a look at them if you can. I will speak about these dynamics, but I also would like to take the opportunity to uh, reflect on uh, the similarities and the differences of this the current episode we're seeing with what happened in 2019. And also, I would like to take stock of the past two weeks since the coup to reassess the strategic landscape of what remains a very fluid situation. Uh, the main point I'd like to develop today is that the current situation bears a superficial resemblance to the revolutionary period of 2019. But a lot has actually changed since then, and we are in many ways in a in a very new and, and, and more dangerous moment at the, right now. 
So for those who do not follow closely, uh, I guess it makes sense to briefly go over some of the relevant developments uh, in, the past, uh, in the past two years. In December 2019, uh, President Omar al-Bashir, who had taken power in a coup in 1989, was struggling uh, in the face of a spiraling economic crisis. He was running out of options politically also. Uh, he had been an expert at playing one side against the other, uh, but after doing so for so long, he had few allies left both domestically and internationally. The United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia stopped their financial support to his government on that month of December 2018. And shortly afterwards, after uh, Bashir lifted subsidies on bread, uh, Sudanese people took to the streets in protest. Four months later, in April uh, 2019, the mobilization reached a critical mass. Hundreds of thousands of people, uh, if not more, demonstrated across the country. And in Khartoum, the protesters staged a sit-in in front of the military headquarters. It's at that moment that the military, uh, paramilitary and security generals around Bashir turned against him. They removed him and they installed the so-called uh, Transitional Military Council, or TMC, a junta. But the demonstrators refused to back down and they continued their sit-in, uh, demanding a civilian government. The Transitional Military Council agreed to negotiate with the leaders of the opposition to Bashir, gathered under the umbrella of the Forces of Freedom of Change and Change, the FFC. But the negotiations went nowhere at the beginning because the generals refused opposition demands for institutions in which the civilians would have the upper hand. And on the 3rd of June 2019, as many of you know, uh, the police and paramilitary rapid support forces a militia which traces its roots to the Janjaweed of Darfur, cracked down on the city and killing more than 130 people and injured, injuring several hundred. The massacre prompted international outcry, but it did not discourage demonstrators who came out again by the hundreds of thousands, if not the millions, on the 30th of June 2019 to demand, again, civilian rule. And from the beginning, the Sudanese revolution was the arena for regional power plays. Uh, the UAE reached out to opposition groups in mid-February 2019 to gauge their willingness to enter a new configuration of power without Bashir, but with elements of the old regime. Uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia backed uh, General Mohammed Hamdan Daglo, known as Hamidti, the head of the RSF, and the UAE and Saudi Arabia also had close ties, of course, with military general Abdel Fattah al-Bohan, the new leader of the Transitional Military Council. Uh, both had deployed in Yemen in the Saudi-led coalition. In the last days of Bashir's rule, both Saudi Arabia and the UAE uh, reportedly offered Bashir an exit plan, which he refused. Uh, the generals under him then went to Cairo shortly before the coup to seek the support of the Arab Troika to their move. After that coup of April 2019, the Arab Troika uh, threw its weight behind the new military regime. The UAE and Saudi Arabia offered three billion dollar in direct support, some of it in cash, the rest in fuel and wheat. And as the negotiations between the TMC and the FFC were taking place, the UAE worked to co-opt a segment of the FFC known as Sudan Call. Over the summer of 2019, the FFC and the TMC ironed out the power sharing agreements, thanks to a mediation of the African Union, but also under pressure from the US, the UK, uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE working together um, as the Quad. And this agreement, known as the Constitutional Declaration, formed the basis for what was meant to be a transition to free elections and a new constitutional order. Uh, in September 2019, Abdullah Hamdok was chosen by the FFC to become the Prime Minister. Western powers at the time praised the Const Constitutional Declaration as a basis for further reform. Uh, the idea was that we would have a civilian-led government as with the objective, uh, ultimate objective of civilian rule, but in the short term. Uh, from the perspective of Western powers, the uh, uh, revolutionaries had to accommodate the presence of the military. Uh, in private, diplomats acknowledged that it, it was a compromise, a step down from the revolutionaries' demands for civilian rule, since the generals kept control of the ministries of defense and interior and had a strong presence in the mixed military-civilian sovereignty council, which was at the helm of the transition. The Sudanese Communist Party at the time denounced the deal as a soft landing for the generals. Let's now fast forward two years to the 25th of October 2021, when uh, General Burhan put an end to these two years of transition. 
the coup began in the early hours of the morning with the arrest of Prime Minister Hamdok and senior figures of the FFC, including civilian members of the Sovereignty Council, but also ministers and party leaders. Uh, the coup had been expected, uh, as uh, Muzan said. Uh, Burhan had almost announced it with a campaign of maneuvering and astroturfing for the previous month. And hours before the arrest of civilian leaders, the U.S. Special Envoy Jeffrey Feldman had warned Burhan that the U.S. support to Sudan was contingent on a continuation of the transition. As soon as they woke up and learned of the coup, the Sudanese poured on the streets to protest. The foreign powers, most foreign powers and international organizations also issued a barrage of condemnations. Uh, the U.S., Germany and the World Bank suspended their support. Usually, in successful coups, and I refer here, I refer you to the book of Noni Helsink called Seizing Power, which in my view is the best reference on the topic. In, in successful coups, the plotters act swiftly and decisively to create the perception that the success of the coup is inevitable. Uh, this perception becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy when the, those who would want to oppose the coup uh, renounce to do it because they think it's already too late, even when it's not, and the coup is just underway. In the case of Burhan's takeover, this decisiveness this was not on display. He waited until the late hours of the morning to make a statement. He made vague promises to hold elections and appoint a civilian cabinet of technocrats, but he hadn't lined up anyone for the job of prime minister. And people on the ground in Khartoum that morning didn't see a heavy security and military presence, which would grow bigger as the day went by. But at the, in the morning, there were no clear signs of, of heavy deployment. In other words, the coup felt a little sloppy. Um, in the past two weeks since then, we have seen more vacillations, which suggest that Burhan and his partner, Hemeti, don't really have a clear plan, or if they had a plan, they miscalculated the reaction to their coup, and they are now largely improvising. Unfortunately, this doesn't mean that they will easily give up. In the first week after the coup, the military and security forces shot and killed uh, protesters with live ammunition on many occasions, including on the 30th of October during the March of the Million, opposing military rule. The authorities also arrested more political leaders as well as grassroots activists following the first round of arrests. And Burhan otherwise appeared to accept the many international mediation efforts which emerged in reaction to the military takeover, including from the UN and the US. In that respect, the events at first looked a lot like what we saw during the spring and summer of 2019 when re revolutionary demonstrations and international mediation tilted the balance of power and forced the military to, to compromise and accept some form of power sharing with civilians. The actors such as the UN or the US, as I mentioned, which have been involved in mediating between Burhan and Hamdok, who remains under house arrest, called for a return to the power sharing agreement of the constitutional declaration. It seemed that Burhan in the first week or so after the coup expected Hamdok to accept, uh, to return as prime minister in a new cabinet that would exclude the FFC and with a much smaller sovereignty council an arrangement which in effect would use Hamdok's popularity to divide the revolutionaries. And this mediation was shaky from the beginning. Uh, key civilian figures have remained in incommunicado detention, and with Hamdok under house arrest, one side was clearly been uh, negotiating under coercion from the other side. For this reason, the process could not be expected to be taken seriously by the Sudanese who went out to protest the coup. In addition, Burhan, when he seized power, demonstrated that he will not keep his word. And for that reason, he cannot credibly commit to a new power sharing agreement. Finally, by aiming for a return to the power sharing agreement, the mediators overlooked a crucial political fact, uh, which uh, we already discussed in this panel, which is that the coup has convinced very large segments of the Sudanese population and certainly an overwhelming majority of the Sudanese who have been demonstrating that the military should not be allowed to stay in politics altogether. Over the past few weeks, over the past week, sorry, the prospect for an agreement in the short term between Burhan and Hamdok appear, appears to have faded. Uh, Hamdok seems to have refused the arrangement that Burhan wanted, and he demands the release of political figures and activists who are currently detained. 
The junta, on the other hand, is giving signs that it is preparing to proceed with a hamdok. The authorities have released senior Islamist figures from the ruling party of Omar al-Bashir, figures which could, could potentially serve as ministers in a new cabinet. The new authorities are also expanding their crackdown against civil society uh, with a campaign of arrests. The plainclothes agents, which were ubiquitous under Bashir, are back. Uh, the authorities have, uh, embarrassingly enough for the UN, arrested interlocutors of the UN Special Representative, Volker Perthus, who was among the mediators. And yesterday, 110 people, uh, as, as Musa mentioned, were arrested, mostly teachers and members of the resistance committees following a uh, teacher's protest. And as we've mentioned already, again, internet has been cut off for nearly two weeks. The generals are now closing ranks. Yesterday, Hemeti, the leader of the RSF, went on TV to announce his support for the coup after weeks of silence. Uh, revolutionaries, for their part, remain defiant and resistance committees have announced a new mass protest on thir the 13th of, no of November. Uh, the situation in my view is extremely concerning. The past two years of transition and the coup of 25th, the 25th of October have convinced both the military and the grassroots revolutionaries that cooperation is not an option. Even if international mediators somehow managed to convince Burhan and some civilian leaders to strike an agreement, the deal would lack a popular legitimacy and protests will continue, uh, which uh, is likely to lead to further repression. The most obvious course of action for Bodhan and Hemeti at this stage is to try to move forward with their agenda of a technocratic cabinet and to play for time, hoping that the revolutionaries will get bored or discouraged and that the international front against uh, the, the coup will somehow crack. Um, this, by the way, is kind of what they did in April and May 2019 in comparable circumstances where they really played for time and, and, and stalled in negotiations uh, before cracking down on, on demonstrators on the 3rd of June. At this stage, it's very unlikely that the revolutionaries will demobilize. Uh, the coup has galvanized them and they understand that the generals will try to stall. And the best response to that is to keep up the pressure with the regular schedule of mass protests. So it's fair to expect a large turnout for the 13th of November protests. So in short, we're going toward an escalation of the struggle for power. No one, in, of course, can predict where this power struggle will lead, uh, but we can still try to spell out the factors that are likely to shape uh, its outcome. First is the popular mobilization itself. And uh, here I'd like to spell out a bit, uh, a few findings from my, my, my PhD research into the Tunisian Revolution to try to spell out some of the, the effects of various effects of protest during these moments. First, the one effect at the minimum is that they demonstrate preferences of the people who are on the street. Uh, when they're sufficiently large and sustained, uh, they, however, can shape the balance of power also by signaling resolve and creating convergent understandings of what solution to the crisis is legitimate among the people who are on the streets. Demonstrations can also focalize demands. Mass sit-ins, for, in for instance, can lead to uh, the emergence of a single iconic demand, which can be invaluable, especially in movements that don't have a centralized leadership. Uh, this is what we saw in Tunisia during the revolution, where uh, the sitting at the Bardo led to the emergence of a demand for elections for a constituent assembly. And this is also what we saw in the city of uh, Al Qiyada in Sudan in 2019, where the demand for civilian rules really kind of largely uh, uh, emerged from, from the city itself. And finally, in authoritarian settings like Sudan, mass demonstrations can encourage uh, sympathetic mid ranking officers of the military or the police to rebel and overthrow a military leadership. Uh, it's my hope that in the coming weeks, the resistance committees, which are the vanguard of the mobilization, will be able to organize in a way that reflects their own uh, uh, political priorities and maximizes participation and impact, and also in a way that anticipates the possibility that this will be a long and drawn out protest. Over the past three years, they've developed a lot of experience and understand that efforts are now made to build a stronger and more visible leadership among the various uh, resistance committees. The second factor that will shape the outcome of this power struggle is the international reaction. And what transpires so far 
um, gives me ground for more cautious optimism in comparison to 2019. Uh, Egypt, the UAE and Russia were among the few countries that did not condemn the coup, but probably under US pressure, the UAE joined a statement with the US, the UK and Saudi Arabia calling for a restoration of the constitutional declaration. And while there is no doubt that the Gulf countries and Egypt have no appetite for democracy in Sudan, they seem for now to be on the back foot. A third factor uh, is the position of the armed groups uh, from Sudan's peripheries, which joined the transitional institutions in the wake of the Juba peace agreement last year. They've been split on the coup. Uh, some have opposed it. But even the two groups that have veered in favor of the coup, the Justice and Equality uh, Movement and the Sudan Liberation Army of Mini Minawi, uh, these two groups have also vacillated. And it will be important to watch in the coming weeks whether they go all in in support of Burhan and Hemeti. If they do, it will be very bad news for revolutionaries. And finally, the dynamics within the military and security forces will be crucial in determining their junta's response to protests. The coup cast a veil over the deep divisions between the military and the RSF. Uh, the military itself is also not immune to factionalism, though we have very little visibility uh, on what is happening there and what the main fault lines are. Now that Burhan and the generals have overturned the transition and taken the risk to isolate Sudan internationally again, it's not clear how they will respond to the pressure from the streets. Will they make concessions or will they instead decide to go all in with the repression? The internal, the internal divisions within the military and security apparatus could break out in the open on the occasion of, of such fateful moments and decisions. So I've spoken too long already, so I will leave it at this for now, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Jean-Baptiste. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Raja. Okay, I've not prepared a, pre a presentation, but what I'm going to do is just try and comment on uh, um, uh, Jean-Baptiste and Mozan's um, um, very well thought out presentations. And since the discussion is about revolution, counter-revolution, I was going to try and kind of uh, try and thrash out some of the counter-revolutionary features that um, um, kind of, you know, pop out um, or kind of are, are seen visible when, when dealing with some of these issues. Um, so, um, one of the... Um, the the counter one one of the kind of um, um, counter revolutionary characteristics or features that have been present in um, the 2018 revolution from the beginning was the depoliticization of the um, uh, process from the beginning, and um, it was driven at two levels. Um, first, at the level of the public, uh, the pro democracy movement itself, the street. But also within within the uh, kind of uh, um, 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 more organized institutional aspects of it, um, and this has a history in Sudan. Obviously, um, uh, the public uh, is very well aware of uh, the historical problems and shortfalls of um, um, the Sudanese uh, civilian um, civic and civilian parties. Um, and the failure uh, uh, to to to, to transition, and the failure on their part to transition to democracy. Uh, there are huge issues that have to do with um, um, uh, trust and reliability, um, as well as other things. And for that reason, they opted to to um, um, to, to, to to kind of you know um, sideline anything that had to do with politics, and that's almost impossible in a process like this. Um, at the level of institutions, whether they were um, um, the Sudanese professional associations, the uh, the, uh, the union, the, the, the different unions, the workers, um, you know, the, the modern forces that were involved in the process of the revolution, they condoned uh, uh, a meritocracy to replace uh, uh, the politics at the state level. And that, from the onset, created a problem where um, uh, the people handed over the business of governance uh, to models as opposed to 
um, uh, process that was, you know, grassroots driven and reflected uh, the needs and the realities of the Sudanese people, as well as the class struggles and, and, and you know, um, uh, the root causes of Sudan's many problems, the reason why we've reached this stage today. Um, and so I would say that the maneuvering tactics that Mozen had explained at the beginning of the pro-democracy movement uh, of the public in an attempt to try and kind of uh, um, uh, save um, uh, the very little kind of, you know, progress that they had achieved through uh, installing um, uh, a part civilian government. Uh, at some point also worked uh, against them uh, eventually. Um, and, and, and to that end, there's going to have to be a lot of work at, at this point uh, done by the resisting committees and by other uh, uh, pro-democracy forces to deal with the depoliticization issue. I mean, it's still, its roots are still quite strong. And when you, he when you hear people talk and support the revolution, demands of the revolution, it still comes across as quite as depoliticized. Um, 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 this uh, um, uh, process of conscious ra consciousness raising and intellectual uh, homework that Muzin has also referred to earlier um, um, requires a great deal of, you know, immersion in, in, in politics at every level if it's going to de deliver um, in the next stage, what, what is needed to, to, to push this transition really forward. Um, I think Muzan mentioned this earlier as well when we were talking about the weakness that had to do with, uh, with, with, with the unionization element of, uh, of um, the grassroots uh, mobilization. Um, I also wanted to mention here that um, uh, the nature of Sudanese politics over the last 50 years because of um, uh, autocratic governments, um, autocratic military systems uh, banning uh, uh, multi-party politics, um, um, alternative groups uh, that are um, uh, mostly professional or union-based took on uh, a political character. It was necessary at the time, but eventually it became, I mean, it, um, it, its consequences were, as, as we saw um, in the aftermath of the revolution and when the government was, the transitional government was sworn in, uh, the kind of factionalism that we saw in the SPA and the, and the politicization of it and uh, um, was some of the consequences of um, uh, so sorry. So just to explain again that this politicization of groups uh, that not were not meant to be political to begin with uh, created the hierarchy um, amongst uh, different types of workers or different kind of professionals, blue and white, and uh, as a result, uh, the factionism within uh, uh, led to the preference of uh, some groups, some professions. Over, other, over others and all played against uh, or along uh, certain class struggles or certain class lines. Um, so on the top, uh, you had certain professionals who were also closer to the state, were also closer to the state institutions, to the machinery of the state uh, and to the civilian cabinets. And, um, um, you know, kind of, you know, um, these um, uh, these political affiliations did affect in a negative way um, uh, the democratic outcome of um, uh, uh, labor and worker organization. Um, so this is also something else um, that uh, uh, the pro-democracy movement is going to have to take on. Uh, uh, how do they do with how do they deal with the politicization of uh, institutions um, and uh, professional based groups? While at the same time, on the other hand, they have depoliticized, depoliticized, um, uh, um, uh, p uh, you know, um, uh, agendas. Um, one last issue I wanted to mention is also, and just to follow up on what Muzan already mentioned, 
is about the class struggles within within the resistance committees. That if this um, uh, vehicle or this is if this kind of you know popular institution is to become the the vanguard of the revolution and uh, democracy moving forward, then yes, the issue of uh, class differentiation between not just between different. Um, neighborhoods uh, but across different states as well will will come to the surface come to the surface at some point and um, um, the really interesting thing is that they are actually mimic um, 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 uh, the the politics of the transition to a degree so some of the more known uh, neighborhood committees that have achieved quite a bit and kind of you know achieved some fame uh, over the past two years are ones, for example, that have managed to democratically elect their members. And obviously this this is a great thing and an achievement that you don't even see in parties that are 60, 70 years old. But there's also a concern that, you know, uh, um, li liberal or liberalized uh, democratic kind of mechanisms of election would um, um, remain um, at the center or the, uh, the main uh, um, form of uh, defining an institution rather than it electing alongside also de developing pl uh, you know, political and class consciousness and realizing that at some point, even if the state was to reform after a long battle, it is the sons and daughters uh, of you know the petite bourgeois, um, members of resisting committees of uh, of you know uh, high um, upper class neighborhoods like these that will eventually inherit the states. Um, the question is, is then how do they manage, and how do they govern, um, in relation to um, um, you know the history of, of of Sudan, its politics, but also moving forward based on you know this kind of collective mobilization that they've all gone through at some point um i think that's it one 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 last point i just wanted to make was about the information war and the issue of digital democracy and social media and the use of social media uh, obviously um and at the same time uh, for those on social media, those who have access, those of us who are on the, uh, you know, in the uh, um, uh, on the outside, the diaspora, you see a lot of um, um, uh, state-based uh, uh, social media flat platforms or kind of you know quasi state-based uh, social media platforms that um, uh, actually kind of uh, uh, peddle misinformation around the development of events. And they're actually kind of uh, devised in a very kind of, um, 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 I would say, um, um, almost smart way. Um, um, so, and they mostly have to do with uh, uh, Hamdouk and the negotiations and what points have been agreed on. Um, and then others have to do with the, um, uh, the normal running of the state of state affairs. So we talk about how um, um, uh, the customs uh, national office has, you know, passed a policy that suggests that uh, people will be able to get, you know, tax cuts or tax breaks. And then you get another one that talks about how uh, schools are running normally in different places and uh, a gov some government official has met with another one in some place. And it gives you the sense that actually the strike has been broken, the civil disobedience has been kind of, you know, disrupted. Um, uh, and obviously this this creates a kind of, you know, a ripple effect that might end up kind of weakening um, somehow uh, um, uh, the movement movement in some, at, at some level. Um, so uh, these are comments just from my side to kind of just uh, try and, uh, and uh, contribute to the rich, rich discussion that uh, Jean-Baptiste and Muzin had uh, started. Um, I'm happy to contribute uh, again once uh, there are discussions and as part of the debate. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Raja, and everybody else for your insights, your analysis. Um, also, I know it's very late where you are, so I appreciate you also being here with us and kind of, you know, staying uh, present and focused at this time um, of night. Um, I'm going to actually got some questions from the audience, but I want to uh, first see 
Uh, one, if you might want to respond to each other now that you've all spoken. Um, one question that kind of remains, um, I don't think that we've touched on, is the role, if any, that uh, people in the diaspora, but also um, people interested in, who are not part of the diaspora, who are interested in supporting um, some of the entities and organizers on the ground, uh, what their role might be. And I should preface this by saying that I think we often overstate our role in the diaspora, but I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, um, especially uh, Mozan and Raja, um, but also, of course, Jean-Baptiste. Uh, and then I'll, I'll ask some of the other questions that have come from the audience. Okay. Um, should I go first? Mozan, are you okay with me going first? Okay, so obviously the diaspora has done quite a bit, not just for the last two years, but before that, and it continues to be the lifeline of the revolution, providing everything from funding to kind of, you know, international pressure and advocacy, as well as technical support. Um, but I have to say that, um, unfortunately, it didn't stop at that. Um, um, the kind of integration and the continuity of the um, kind of, you know, uh, external, internal process uh, has meant that um, um, this kind of, you know, what I was describing earlier, the kind of depoliticized kind of meritocracy based technocratic kind of um, face of a new democracy or a new Sudan, democratic new Sudan, uh, took over, and it was fueled, you know, by the presence of, you know, the transitional, sorry, um, uh, by um, um, the contributions of the of the diaspora, whether from remote, in terms of uh, um, uh, international aid uh, funding that fueled through to Sudan in the form of projects or whatever, or in their actual kind of, you know, presence. Uh, I mean, they picked up themselves and they went back to Sudan and they just, you know, they, they became the rank and file of um, the um, uh, state institutions. Um, and um, uh, obviously intentions notwithstanding, um, uh, I think the concern was that, again, um, if you try and run a government externally, um, and then it, its collapse becomes much, much more easier. Um, uh, and I feel that um, we all as diaspora should really try and learn from our mistakes moving forward. Um, and uh, use all our resources to try and encourage you know, the people on the ground to decide from the, for themselves how, want to be, how they want to be governed what kind of politics they want to kind of uh, employ in themselves and within the states, uh, what democracy, ha have them define what democracy means um, and not allow, you know, these ideas of um, kind of, you know, fancy technocracy to kind of, you know, hijack, hijack what is meant to be at its core a political process. I say this because most of us diasporas, just by, 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 by mere virtue of being away, it kind of depoliticizes you in a sense. I mean, uh, because you're just not part of, you know, the everyday political economy of that country. Your livelihood doesn't depend on it, right? And you know, obviously that 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 really that that really is a game changer. Uh, your heart could be the right place. You could be following the details from 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 abroad, but it's not the same as you know being connected to that country on daily uh, on daily basis. Um, and I've already started seeing some really kind of um, uh, um, healthy approaches you know, uh, compared to last time. So um, obviously when, when this, when, when the revolution, when, you know, uh, um, Brown 2 kicked off on the 25th, the first thing that uh, most diasporas went to is, you know, to start, start a fund. Uh, and it kind of, you know, it generated a lot of money immediately. People were really asking some really good questions about how, about where this money was going to this time. How was it going to be used? Uh, I think this is essential and also a part of uh, kind of, you know, developing the political consciousness of the diaspora as well. I mean, wh where are the healthy limits of intervention? Because not just Western states and Western, uh, and, 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 you know, kind of ex other countries that intervene in, 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 um, 
in in domestic politics, uh, intervention could also be, you know, um, influenced and done by by diaspora groups. Um, so so that's it from my side. I'd give the chance to Mizan to. Um, well, um, uh, first of all, I'm sorry I had to turn off my video due to the uh, connection quality. I hope the sound quality is better. Um, well, I'll, I'll pick up from where what Raja said regarding um, how to let the Sudanese people make their decisions about how they want to be, uh, the, the form of governance they want. And, and a big part of that, I, I think I already said that, is hold back your counter-revolutionary government. That's, I think that's the main thing any um, ally of the Sudanese revolution, diaspora, or otherwise should do. Uh, you have a homework to do with your own government or with the government that is held accountable to you, whether you are a citizen or a president or whatever is your status at the place. If they're held accountable to you, you have a space uh, to, to engage and engage um, on that level. I'm, I'm also seeing um, in, um, regarding the, the engagement with the international community, there's also uh, it evolved a lot over the past two years. Uh, while two years ago, we had Sudanese diaspora going to um, the headquarters of the EU with signs of help Sudan. Um, at, we are seeing now a more you know, confronting um, uh, approach where uh, they are at the embassies of the UAE and Saudi Arabia in countries of uh, for example, I just saw one in London, the embassy, uh, the, the in front of the UAE embassy, calling for the UAE to 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 stop their counter-revolutionary intervention in Sudan. But there's also a very strong counter um, counter-revolutionary intervention by the British government itself that needs to be um, highlighted and called out. So um, I, I would say that's the that's the first thing. Um, there's a lot that a lot of people outside Sudan can do. Uh, uh, to help the, the Sudanese resistance, but most of that we can actually do. We can actually fight our battle uh, internally. Just like, please hold your counter-revolutionary government. That, that, that's all from my side. Thank you. Uh, Jean-Baptiste, I don't know if you want to add anything or if you want me to move to the questions. There's some questions coming from the audience as well. Yeah, I mean, I mean I'm, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the questions coming. I just very briefly on the question of, of uh, politicization, depoliticization. I, I agree there was um, a bit of a fallback on the idea of um, kind of technocracy as, as a savior to uh, the inability of much of the political class to kind of uh, overcome their fragmentation. And I think that was a major source of, of, um, of uh, you know, one major reason why, why the transition kind of stalled uh, pretty quickly, um, especially on the issue of the formation of the Transitional Legislative Council. I do think, though, that um, if things continue this way and if really uh, we are heading towards a sustained um, mobilization, I think new actors will emerge to replace uh, the, the, the political elites that have kind of failed this transition period. Um, and uh, they would be a lot more politicized than, uh, than the people they replace. Great, thank you. Um, so here are some um, audience questions. Um, I'm going to read out two and then you can uh, kind of decide how you want to answer. Uh, the first question here um, is to Muzan and Raja. A lot of uh, a lot of scenarios are being drawn as possible exits from this current political dilemma. From your point of view, how do you envision the transition of this dilemma? And then a question to all panelists. What are the strengths that the current revolution can rely on to transition out of this historical political dilemma? So maybe we'll start with those. There's a couple more that I'll ask later. Uh, sorry, Nisri, could you um, repeat the second question, please? Sure. Uh, um, a question to all panelists. What are the strengths that the current revolution can rely on to transition out of this historical political dilemma? And they're also in the chat here. Um, okay, I can try and take the um, transition scenario, um, the first question. 
um, to be honest, the way I'm thinking about it is um, I'm not really kind of concerned a lot with, you know, state or big man politics. Um, I think uh, there there is um, there is a big chance that um, um, this kind of you know um, uh, military takeover will stabilize, uh, the coup will move forward. Um, but what remains, I think, um, the most important um, um, element of revolutionary work at this stage is for the pro-democracy movement in the street and on the ground to build their institutions. Because there will come a moment, like it did two years ago, of rupture, right? when the system will fall. The question then is, can we afford to lose another um, uh, opportunity? So for me, at least, building at the grassroots, at grassroots level uh, of you know the resisting committees, uh, their uh, um, you know local um, kind of you know council-like uh, level authority, uh, and kind of fusing that with uh, union work and, um, and and labor's rights and. Uh, you know, the twinning of them, uh, building them solid, uh, developing their demands, uh, um, de developing their tools, their institutions, um, as they continue to push against, you know, the um, uh, the system. And the system isn't just the military, right? I mean, it says this, is enti this entire kind of uh, elite uh, system of power and wealth sharing uh, that permeates uh, every aspect of, you know, state and everyday life. Um, so, yeah. Well, Thank you. Jump in. Go ahead, please, Muslim. Sure. Um, well, um, I don't know if we're asking about what is the scenario we would like to see happening or um, the scenarios that can happen. Well, the scenarios that can happen, I, I, I no longer think that those are very predictable. Uh, we've seen that the, the, the military goes beyond the predictable and the reasonable. Uh, they've previously committed a massacre inside the capital, um, um, a broadcasted massacre to a far extent via social media, and they were rewarded uh, for that with um, a good share of power, if power can be shared, and um, basically with, with strengthening their position um, and, and, and their control over even the big portions of the, of the economy. Um, so what can happen, w once you do a massacre and you get rewarded to it, I don't think it's very easy to predict what you're going to do next. So whatever comes next is thanks to those who rewarded them two years ago. Uh, that, is, that is something to be remembered. Uh, what is the scenario that I would, uh, I think we sh I would like to see happening or I think is the way uh, forward? I think Raja, Raja touched on it when she talked about in, uh, that it's, it's a full system that we need to think of. So we might know um, the the act the 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 civil acts of civil protest, whether it is strikes or pro marching and so on, that m can get us to to the point of what uh, Jean Petit called the, the critical mass in the streets, leading to the, the 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 military or whoever is in power not being able to maintain uh, the power anymore. Our problem had always been with what's next, and I think a, a good scenario starts by building the what's next from. Uh, uh, clearly targeting the points of power of the system to have a clear plan of at that moment what do you do um, wh what it's not like at that moment that you are in the streets you're gonna you you're gonna march to all the military investments and take over them that will be great but there's a good chance that does not happen but how do you take that first step within the march to break down where their power centers is we always talk about um, the, you know, um, um, uniting the militias in one national army. Uh, our army has not been restructured since independence, so this is the same structure of the of the army of the of the colonial British at the time. Um, so there's there's a lot to talk about when it comes to restructuring or reforming the army or the military force and um, and so on. But also, how do you, how do you do that while they have they have their own money. You do have no control over it. So what I'm saying is that a good scenario starts by targeting the, the points, uh, the centers, 
uh, of power of starts by creating some steps that take um, take takes you forward uh, to that point of totally dismantling it. Um, it's it's to be detailed. That's I think that is the work, um, and that is the work of the revolutionary organization. This is not something that can can be done without having the, the right, you know, the the the, the right intellectual backing and the right ideology uh, that you will use to figure out what is that power and how do you work around it. Um, um, the, there's the, the question of um, the strength uh, that the, the revolution can, can right now rely on. I think our, very, the, our, our strongest uh, anything to, to, to support us right now is the experience of the past two years. It is very difficult. And we saw that over the past weeks, it is very difficult to re, um, recycle the messaging of uh, 2019. Uh, whether it is we need to uh, compromise to slop, stop the bloodshed, whether, whether it is, oh, the international community is on our side, so everything is going to be fine, you can return to, to your homes, whether it is uh, good technocrats are going to take care of everything. All of those arguments, all of those messages that were used two years ago, have been um, ridiculed over the past two weeks. Our biggest strength, I think, is going back to building on the experience, analyzing the experience, because even what we now know to some extent intuitively, and because the experience is so clear, that also fades away if there isn't a pro proper uh, critical analysis that is conveyed in the clearest language possible so people can then internalize it and use it as they evaluate the, the next steps. So I would say, the best thing that happened to us is that they did their coup after long enough, so we see how the compromise does not work, but it was soon enough that we still remember how it started and not willing to repeat it again. Thank you, Mouton. Um Jean-Baptiste, would you like to comment as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I just have a few, a few, few ideas on, on, on what's been said. I mean, I'd, I'd like to respectfully disagree with, with Raja. I think, uh, as much as, um, as much as, uh, you, you know, long term, um, build, building the revolutionary forces in the long term is important. If the coup succeeds and consolidates itself, the revolutionary, the, the resistance committees won't have the luxury to 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 to, to remain active and recruit and, and build themselves over the long term. There will be a widespread crackdown, and that will be the end of it for you know 20 years. Which is why the current period is so critical, and uh, which is why the question of who controls the state is so critical. Um, um, I think what's maybe kind of missing a bit of in the conversation is is how uh, the, the kind of reality of the state um, that Bashir built, which is a state with a bloated military and security apparatus, uh, various segments uh, distrust, deeply distrusting each other. We also have all the armed groups, of course, like th there are hundreds of thousands of, of armed men in Sudan who are organized in factions. And um, I'm very concerned about what will happen if, uh, if they're, you know, if they're among themselves and uh, they become the main political actors. And uh, I think there's a serious risk that Sudan could drift at one point into, into a civil war, the same way South Sudan drifted into civil war when you just had two factions of, of the states uh, competing with one another, two to armed factions. Um, so I, I do think the challenge right now for revolutionaries in Sudan is to articulate how how to get to a point where the military is not in charge. I mean, what what are the ways that this could happen? Um, and uh, the solutions there are, I mean, the, the ways it could happen are all fraught with risks or, or ethical issues, right? One issue would be to uh, offer um, a golden retirement to Burhan and Hameti for them to go to Saudi Arabia, like Ben Ali did. Uh, of course, that poses serious problems for justice and accountability. Another path forward would be to for the revolutionaries to find um, allies within the military and security apparatus, people who are willing, who would be willing to subordinate themselves to a civilian role. 
but then the challenge comes in terms of identifying these people, in terms of these people taking action, uh, which is also fraught with risk. I think these are these are really the, the questions I think that should be at the center of of the strategic reflection of of the revolutionaries in terms of how do we go from no to civilian rule to actually getting there? Because there is a, a, a very basic reality, which is that um, there is an asymmetry of power between the people who hold the gun and people who are in the crosshair. Um, and that's that's kind of a, unfortunately a, a defining kind of characteristic of, of uh, these moments of, uh, of crisis and revolution. So how do we go beyond beyond this problem? That's I think that's the, the question that we need to be answered in the coming few months. Um, thank you. Um, so there are a couple of questions that um, relate to the diaspora's role, but I'm going to actually ask. Um, so I'm going to ask a couple uh, at once, and then you can kind of decide which ones you want to answer. Um, the first one is not about the diaspora, but it, it, uh, it reads: We heard of attempts by the resistance committees to assign their own spokespersons. If true, are we seeing the first steps towards a more elaborate political agenda and leadership? I'm going to just read it twice because it's not in the chat. We heard of attempts by the resistance committees to assign their own spokespersons. If true, are we seeing the first steps towards a more elaborate political agenda and leadership? Uh, and then there are a couple from, um, sorry, I'm trying to pull them up here. Um, can you please elaborate on how to strengthen the diaspora's role? not just protesting in front of UAE, Egypt, and Saudi Arabian embassies, I would appreciate a concrete political actions uh, to perform. And then relatedly, are we expecting, or from the same person, are we expecting any de-escalation from the military remaining al-Bashir security forces, RSF, with the growing Sudanese populist movement? So those are, I know, three very different questions, but again, um, however you want to, to answer them first, um, and which you don't have to answer all of them, um, but yeah. Can you repeat the third question, please, Nisreen? Sure. Um, the third question was, are we expecting any de-escalation from the military remaining al-Bashir security forces, RSF, with the growing Sudanese populist movement? Um, let me start with the first question uh, regarding the resistance committees. Um, I think not only the the, the appointing of um, official sp spokespersons, but the process of of creating demands that we've seen happening over the past two years. We've seen um, and uh, we've seen um, 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 to a part extent a very transparent process of one resistance committees put a committee putting out their demands, uh, demands being adopted by another or being. Um, uh, rephrased uh, by another or another committee, uh, creating a, a different set of um, uh, of demands and coming together within the with, within a structure of a, of one city or one state to share to share demands. And, and that's what I was talking about. That the the, the attempts to create uh, joint demands or joint charters or declarations by by the resistance committees. Those those are what pushing the resistance committees to 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 elaborate further their political stances, even to to to, to think further about their political stances and 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 what the even what the three no's means what, what is no no compromise what is a compromise uh, uh, the, uh, to, to what to what extent are we uh, do we have a clear image of what is the the state that we want to have and anything that does not comply with it is uh, is uh, rejected or do we have uh, certain values, um, you know, broad line values that everything we cannot compromise on. So things have to had to move from slogans to more elaborated, and since it had to go through discussions, I imagine between different committees that that deepened the 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 the, the understanding, uh, deepened the the gave them even more more value and substance. And we saw that we saw that happen in 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 real life. We saw that as the as the statements. Evolved in content and in nature and in phrasing over the the past uh, two weeks since uh, since the coup. Uh, so that was maybe the blessing of the coup, if there are any. Um, I'll leave that question regarding to the diaspora to Raja. Um, 
Okay, um, well, I mean, I've touched on this quite a bit earlier. Mm. But I think it, 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 it falls on the diaspora as a group with um, a lot of um, uh, access to different kind of resources, right? And, and, and like a strong group whose presence um, inside and outside Sudan is, um, um, is, is, is felt. Um, so I would say that maybe part of the work is to answer this question for themselves as well, right? As part of this process of understanding how they fit or how their contribution could be more um, um, uh, kind of, uh, kind of, you know, has more of a positive effect. Um, for example, um, two two issues um, that came up um, uh, in 2020, which was, you know, the, the kind of the, the most, I think, the most stable year of the uh, the transitional um, uh, period. Um, so uh, one of them has to do with um, how Sudan was reported on um, on uh, in international media outlets but also how it was kind of, you know, conceptualized and how, you know, this, this transition period. Um, I mean, it was, it was mostly kind of um, uh, uh, related to the outside world through the eyes and, you know, um, uh, mouthpieces of, of the diaspora. Um, and, and the accounts were, were lacking, and I could understand why, because obviously it was um, communicated from the perspectives of the diaspora whose presence in Sudan or whose kind of connection was uh, um, uh, uh, short, but also kind of limited by the possibility of access and language and, and, and many other things. Um, so um, that's one thing. The other thing is, I feel that maybe they haven't done the necessary work in the same sense that the, let's say, the uh, the pro democracy movement is doing on the ground to build, you know, pro kind of, you know, mechanisms to allow uh, um, for, you know, for them to become a conduit between uh, uh, um, the world and and the Sudanese. And I think they, only they have that kind of ability. Um, just one example is just what Mozan referred to earlier, that this has been happening for almost three years now. And um, where we are with international media is that we still don't, I mean, the international media outlets have not developed uh, um, the right kind of contact list with, um, experts on Sudan uh, or contacts in Sudan to kind of debrief them on these kind of situations when they happen or, you know, when, when these kind of escalations happen. Uh, the kind of systems in place still, despite some of these platforms have having, you know, a lot of resources, they do not allow for uh, the kind of, you know, differences in, you know, access to language um, and, you know, um, as well as other skills that allows you know the the information to come in from from the people themselves, uh, and all these systems, I mean, they, they have to be built. Someone has to contribute to their creation. They're just otherwise it's going to be just the same situation on and on. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is that um, the diaspora in this age and time is part of a transnational kind of you know political but also economic class whose roots and heritage are connected to Sudan, but also this this movement of this, you know, the kind of, of, of labor and middle class, you know, based on their professional skills from one place to another. So we're seeing a new, an, an emergence of a new type of professional elites. And we've seen that in, in Sudan during the transition, again, with this kind of, you know, um, emergence of, uh, you know, you know, emergence of demand for a technocracy, and most of them did come either from the Americas or even from 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 the Gulf countries. Um, that's that that's on the surface. Uh, behind behind the scenes, um, with the political parties, especially the new ones, like the Sudan, the Sudan uh, Congress Party. Uh, 
the groups or the people, or let's say that the the, 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 sl the sliver that made up uh, the hefty cadres of the Congress Party, um, just behind the politicians, you can't you couldn't see them, but you knew were there were actually made up of, you know, the professionals um, um, uh, who have, you know, lived for decades or second generation, you know, in the Gulf and you know, Western countries or wherever. Um, and um, by by profession, in terms of skill, they were quite, actually quite advanced. They, they occupied kind of, you know, really kind of high level jobs in sectors that were to Sudan, they were vital. So we're talking gas, we're talking petrol, we're talking, um, um, I mean, whatever productive sector it is, it was kind of, you know, a transnational kind of, you know, uh, connection. And they they ha they had the right kind of economic and political contacts, business and, and, and political contacts, but also within themselves, they were quite powerful and they now occupied these spaces within uh, 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 these new kind of you know political formations, and and they get they got to kind of you know uh, direct the process from behind the scenes to a degree. Uh, there remains a lot to be said and understood about these groups and their effects moving forward. Uh, but just to say that the diaspora aren't just a disconnected group uh, whose you know connection to Sudan is one of heritage or you know annual visits to see the family. Uh, and uh, we've all seen, for example, that uh, um, Hamdouk's cabinet, or sorry, Hamdouk's office was made up of, um, you know, some kind of really kind of inf influential kind of, you know, international civil servants who were Sudanese, but who had moved on and worked in really kind of influential places abroad. And they were also part of the system that kind of, you know, facilitated the create, the, you know, the, the international back and international aid support. Um, um, so they are present. They Some of them have uh, some kind of, you know, like an, uh, quite the weight. Uh, and, and there needs to be an understanding of who they are, what they contribute, what the limits are, and also what what, what are the consequences moving forward. Yeah. Um, great, thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on to another question that came um, I'm going to ask again two questions and you can kind of decide how to, uh, well, this first one is actually for Jean-Baptiste. Um, Jean-Baptiste mentioned that both the U.S. and Russia failed to condemn the coup. Can he elaborate on this, particularly Russia's response? Moscow even objected to calling it a coup. Yes. Um, what is the significance of this? So that's the first question to you, Jean-Baptiste. And then the second one um, is one area that has been really neglected is tracing illegal flows of money in and out of the country, not only for military and RSS, but also for the various armed groups. Why has this not happened? If you want yes, to repeat so any of them, let the, me know. Yeah, the, uh, the UAE and Russia failed to, to condemn the, the coup, uh, not, not the US. Uh, but uh, when it comes to Russia, I mean, Russia's long-standing ties to to SAF. Actually, the most most weapons that uh, SAF has been used were uh, were Russian traditionally, and despite the efforts by the U.S. to really kind of bring Sudan in its orbit since um, since the beginning of the transition in 2019, I think the, the, the military has has uh, really uh, tried to 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 keep good relations with Russia, as evidenced by the discussions around the creation of a Russian naval base in Sawakin. Um, on, from the perspective of Hemeti, uh, Hemeti has ties with the Wagner Group, which is, um, as, as you probably know, an kind of an official arm of the uh, of the Russian state. Uh, that's been revealed by Mujahid Bushra, actually, an investigative uh, journalist. Um, so. The logic there would be that they just would uh, expect um, a successful coup to um, uh, to uh, draw Sudan away from the U.S. and allow uh, Russian 
Sudanese uh, relations to um, to strengthen, at least relations with the military. Uh, when it comes to tracing the illegal flows of money in and out of the country, um, when it comes to the military and the RSF, um, it's very difficult to do. I mean, I've done this, other people have tried to do this. It got me uh, declared PNG in, in December. Uh, I, uh, other people have done this and it's very difficult. I mean, a lot of this is, you know, um, operating through uh, shell companies with um, cash transactions, uh, you know, gold being, uh, being flown out of, of, um, of Sudan straight into the UAE without being, you know, on, on private airplanes. So it's very, it's just uh, very difficult to, to document in general. We actually only have a few more minutes uh, to wrap up, and, and I guess in closing, I'd like to ask you all to maybe uh, tell us a few sort of parting words on anything um, you'd like to leave us with, if there's anything you didn't cover, or if there's something that you feel uh, is important to mention that you didn't get a chance to, to say. If you could um, do that, that would be great. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe just a quick point, just to come to reiterate that uh, in, in my view, in, 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 in uh, configurations like we have right now, um, the, uh, the demonstrations work best when they're focalized in one location and uh, they are sustained. And so this is really what I think changed the game after uh, four months of protest in 2019 when the sit-in started. Um, the sit-in at the time appears to have been uh, partly enabled by Salah Ghosh, who enabled uh, protesters to enter the area of the sit-in of the military headquarters. So there were some, some internal games happening within the regime that allowed this to happen. But I do think these are the kind of uh, the, these configurations uh, are really what kind of change the calculation of regime actors when you have uh, very large numbers of people in one location at a given moment in time, and that leads to the emergence of clear demands. Um, um, nothing new from my side, but I would like to highlight and repeat uh, the importance of holding accountable counter-revolutionary government. Um, and that this is really, um, for now, uh, the, the, the main thing that we can get from international or diaspora allies. And it is more important than anything else. Um, if you have an ambassador in Sudan, they probably announced their support for a return to a pre-October 25th uh, situation. And we are rejecting that and uh, making it harder for them to say that makes it easier for us to say something different. Um, if you want to support the Sudanese revolution, that's where it starts. Probably inside your own government. Um, just that um, I saw a tweet from um, a fellow Sudanese the other day uh, explaining the situation in simple but also brilliant terms. This, this struggle uh, to kind of end um, this kind of problematic um, uh, business, political and military elite alliance uh, on the basis of political settlements of power and share uh, power and wealth sharing agreements actually precedes uh, the CPA and has been in uh, you know present in Sudan um, since independence or even before that in one form or another. And that every generation in Sudan had um, uh, kind of, you know, postponed the fight in order to maintain its privileges. You know, it just pushed it to the generation, you know, just um, uh, beneath it. And he said that we can no longer afford to do this. And then, we, I mean, now is the time for, uh, for you know, this battle to, to be taken and for this course to be settled. And it seems that the street is ready. Um, so this this is where we are. Um, 
and I think I think also the the issue, as Muzin said, is that you seldom hear these kind of you know narratives on mainstream international media, um, and this is why probably. Um, um, the world or the international community who is supportive of Sudan, Sudanese people and the revolution, uh, who are getting only the one-sided um, uh, events and details of, you know, uh, big man politics or state politics, um, they are a mess as to, you know, the kind of um, um, emotions and demands that drive the public. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just wanted to end on that note and just say with it, when I read it, I mean, I'm a Sudanese, I'm from Sudan, I follow the details, I mean, but it gave me kind of, you know, it gave me a spur of hope that at times it feels almost important, it's, it's almost impossible uh, to, to maintain or keep a hold of, a hold on. Um, so, uh, yeah. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, I think we're going to end on that note. I know there's still a lot of questions. I had some questions around sort of rural mobilizations and conversations around land reform. And But I think what, what this means is that we need to continue these conversations. Um, it's been really enlightening for me. I hope it has been for you as an audience as well. Um, and again, I want to thank you, especially Muzan, for joining us today from Sudan. I know it's not easy. Um, both accessing the internet, but also being present uh, with us while also organizing on the ground. Um, so I really appreciate all of you for being here and for um, sharing your insights and your analysis. Thank you very much. <laughs>